Hey family, thank you for tuning in to Our Roots Podcast with Joseph Babaifa. We're only the strongest roots see the light brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. And if you haven't had the opportunity, please hit that like button and tap on that subscribe button. Today's episode is on the 16 commandments of Ifa. And these concepts can be found in the Odu of Baba Ikafun. And what happened in this sign was there was a time when the Babalawos were not seeing a lot of results from their practice. So they went to visit Oromila, where divination was performed for the Odu Ikafum to be revealed, where Olodu Mare sent a personal message to each of them, where each of the follies that they were committing were being um, basically corrected. So as we delve in and we look at what each of them is saying, it was unfortunately a behavior that they were delving into previously that caused Olodu Mare to have to reprimand them, right? And um, once they started living correctly and following these laws, not only themselves, but the Olorishas and humanity at large, whoever chose to follow um, the light that was Ifa and the direction of Ifa, started living prosperously and having a lot of longevity. So a question here. Um, I know uh, Ifa has been around literally forever. Pretty much, yeah. You know, and these are the 16 commandments. I know there are some other commandments that are pretty familiar yeah. Um, in the, you know, religious world, and I'm referencing Christianity here. Sure. Um, are there any parallels between these uh, these two? Because I know um, some stories have been borrowed, you know, and interpreted, adapted. Well, you know, when we talk about legitimacy and the original and authenticity, you know, we never want to bring anyone else's into question. But I will say that Africa was around before everybody. Um, the Yoruba tribe, just like various other tribes, had, you know, codes and laws. I mean, even if you look back to Sumeria, with like Hammurabi's law and the tablet and all these different things, there were things around far before um, Christianity um, and possibly even Judaism, right? You know, just based completely on chronological order, um, carbon dating, having nothing to do with religious debate or discourse whatsoever, so um, you're going to see a lot of parallels um, from these things or that which was African indigenous translated into more Abrahamic faiths being that, you know, we have to see where were these conclusions drawn from, especially if there was something beforehand. But when you look at African law, um, those concepts, like it was completely based on that which was natural and moral and anything that went against that went against nature and ultimately the supreme being who created it. So that's where those concepts come from. Mm. So you brought us a present here. You actually have a physical list, physical commitments, and uh, you sent it to me. So we're going to share that on the screen. Yeah, guys, to see. So uh, this, wanna... is, this is really special stuff when uh, Phil pulls it up. So this is actually the paper or piece of cardboard that I had when I was about to do Ifa. And my godfather actually told me that I needed to learn these by memory. So the best list I ever found was actually in one of the pieces of literature he gave to me with the original story that I just mentioned. And I actually wrote them out um, to be able to learn them by memory because he said he wasn't going to initiate me into Ifa unless I recited them um, to him. Now, now, mind you, I, I don't recall them like before, you know, when you, you, you have a prerequisite and you need to have it to be able to move forward, um, you know, at that moment, it's right at the front of the mind. Now, you know, they're pretty much ingrained to where, you know, being in a culture for over 20 years, you know, it's uh, highly unlikely I'm ever going to digress from these. But, um, you know, this is the original piece of paper. I actually don't know where this poster is. Um, I hope to find it in my garage eventually. But I have the photo because this is the same photo I share to everybody that we're going to initiate, whether... Um, whether in Ifa or in Orisha, and I actually wrote it in Spanish because I learned Ifa in Spanish, but I'll be sure to translate them now. I just wanted to share that with you guys because it was hanging in my room, and my grandmother, I remember the first time she walked in, she's like, what's this? And I said, this is what I'm studying right now. She's like, oh, it looks serious, you know? So she saw the ones and the zeros, and she knew it was having to do with uh, Ifa scripture. Is that your handwriting? Yes, it is. You, you actually got pretty good handwriting. Yeah, I'm very blessed. My, my mother and my grandmother had excellent penmanship, and um, I actually learned, uh, you know, cursive. Well, really, I learned cursive in school, but I Im imitated my grandmother quite a bit 
and then print, I, I print a lot like my mom, but if you notice, it kind of goes to the right a little bit because I, I prefer cursive, mm -hmm. um, but for some reason, and I kind of do a mix sometimes. If you'll see some words are like half cursive, half print, it depends on how I feel, but I've always gotten compliments on that, but I give that to really my grandmother and my mother. They have excellent penmanship. You mentioned a minute ago about the X's, X's, O's and the ones and zeros. What, yeah. The, what is, what's that about? So that right there, that combination is, um, LS Otung Ika, which means the right leg is Ika and LS Osi Ofung, which the left leg is Ofung. So that is Ika Ofung because Ifa is red the same way that nature moves from right to left or counterclockwise. If you notice within any of our practices is Babalawo, everything is against um, the clock, you know, because the world kind of rotates that way. We're going, and they say that's why the people who perform a lot of Ebo, they stay so young. Like you look at the old Bawalaos, they would be like 80 and they'd look fabulous. It says because they were always going backwards in time. So they were kind of taking years off of, you know, their, that or adding years to their life, better said, like taking some mileage off of the odometer. Mm. All right. Well, um, I guess let's get started with, uh, with number Number one, right? Absolutely, yeah. Right. I'll say it uh, as I read it, and then we'll go ahead and translate it. El abo no dice lo que no sabe. So it says the priest or the person never says what they don't know. And, and what that makes reference to is that, you know, we don't act like we know something when we don't. You know, it's kind of like a form of lying, like portraying something that we are not. Ifa is all about humility. So, you know, for example, very early on in life, I learned that if you don't know something, be honest that you don't know it, but let them know you're going to go ahead and find that piece of information for them, you know, as quickly as possible. And I, I really took that to heart as well when I opened my business because, you know, we were incorporating a lot of products from traditions that weren't native to ours, right? So we would hear about new things or they would ask us if we had it. And we were very frank, you know, we don't have it. But where we're going to separate ourselves from the competition is by getting it, right? And that's where our inventory grew. So with any five was the same thing. Um, you know, I was always very honest with my clients about what I had the knowledge to do and what I was going to learn to do to be able to serve them better. So if they asked me, hey, can you swear me into Odum? No, at that point, I didn't have that knowledge like I do now. So I would take them to my godfather and we'd, you know, collaborate to be able to take that person through that process or whether it was Orisha or whether it was doing a paraddu. In the beginning, you have to be very honest, and, and most clients don't have an issue with you not knowing how to do something, especially if you're at those beginning stages. They're not choosing the profession, they're choosing the professional. So if they see that you're growing with them, and you're progressing, and you're learning, and you're getting results, and you're being you know recognized as competent, they usually won't leave if you're honest. Now, where you have a real issue is if you lie. You know, and they yeah. catch you in that lie and then, oh, you know, this, I don't think it's a funny story, but it is ironic. There's been stories of people who have done, like, for example, let's say a guy came to me and said, I want you to do Ifa to me. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll do Ifa to you. But then the day after tomorrow, when we're doing Ifa to the other guy, the same guy who said he was going to be doing to him is doing it as well. Like, I heard a story like that. Like, the guy said, yeah, I'll do Ifa to you, but the guy during the ceremony was like, well, Padrino, Godfather, why do you have to go through everything I'm going through if you already did it? And another guy was like, that's not your Godfather. He's doing it together with you because the guy had actually stolen the money um, and used the other guy to be able to initiate as well. So, you know, obviously that's completely taboo and situations came from that from what I understand. But that's just an example of, you know, we don't say what we don't know um, because you lose all prestige. And Odubila never delved into that. Well, what about the, the, the quote, fake it till you make it? Um, but there's ways to fake it without lying. For example, like I think, you know, um, one of the greatest examples I heard about that was uh, Mr. Uh, P. Diddy, right? Um, and this is hearsay, but they said he had, you know, these huge diamond earrings on and whatnot. And they said they had, he had just bought them at a corner store before going into an award show. Now, mind you, you look at a gentleman such as this, hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, you'd think, you know, he's wearing, you know, a million dollars worth of earring diamonds. When in reality, you know, now mind you, he had already made it, but impression is everything. Yeah. Um, I think you're able to, you know, avoid lying um, to not, you know, arrive at the, you know, the point of being disingenuous or untruthful, you know. But you don't, but if you are asked and you are confronted on it, you really want to take that moment to clarify things. But if you're in that position anyway, that means you did something initially wrong. You know, so it's it's better to be authentic from the beginning 
and you avoid all those situations because you find Orisha is a very small world and people are getting checked now more than ever with, you know, social media. People are getting put on blast. And, and that's why I really lean on the integrity of this channel because no one has anything negative really to say about us as far as integrity. You know, they might have some issues with pricing or maybe the, you know, the views by some of our, uh, our guests, but as far as a reflection of us and our integrity as practitioners, never. Yeah. I think that's a, a definite testament for you. Your, your integrity is very high. You're very high regarded. That's, that's all we're about. You know, that's all, that's, that's how we were trained. So, you know, and it's, it's given us great results and I think it comes from patience. You know, we try to do too much too early too soon it causes us to get into those kind of situations and that's not that's not a plan for longevity all right let's go to number two number two no haga ritos de lo que no tenga conocimiento do not perform rites of which you do not have the knowledge so it kind of leans a little bit on number one but it is its own because now we're talking straight ceremony so for example like I said, if, if someone comes to me and they say, Joseph, I'd like you to direct or coordinate the Sifa for me, meaning that I'm going to initiate somebody else. If I do not have the knowledge or complete and absolute certainty of the product and service I'm about to provide, I need to alley-oop that to somebody else because you're playing with people's destinies, you're playing with people's money, their time, and it's going to end very negatively because... The thing about it is, even if said person doesn't know how to direct it themselves, they know how it should look. They know the elements. You know, this isn't our first time in the room at that point. If you're initiating somebody else, you're going to get checked and called out very quickly, and it's going to lead to pretty negative situations. So whether it's a hand of ifa, whether it's a reading, whether it's a random cleaning, whatever you have not studied and prepare yourself to do, you should not do because not only is it going to have negative ramifications on you, more importantly, it's going to have negative ramifications for your family. Ifa does not punish the wrongdoer. He punishes that which the wrongdoer holds dear. So, you know, I've, I've heard of various cases where people did things that were unethical and randomly a family member died, um, a disease, somebody got sick out of nowhere, some phenomenon and by adhering to this second law is how you really avoid that. The problem is when we have elements that, you know, could materialize in thousands of dollars or the, the prestige that comes from initiating or being, you know, Sedi Faro, Disha professional that knows what they're doing, it causes people to, 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 to act. And that really doesn't, it's not a plan for longevity. It will not get you far. Very wise words, man. My man. All right, here you go. Number three. Number three, no lleva la gente por falso camino. Do not take people down false paths or the wrong path. There's actually an Odu known as Ogunda Iwori or Ogunda Kwanaye, where it's known as the false prophet. And this guy had a really, you know, a really big gift when it came to, you know, verbalizing things. He was, uh, he was almost hypnotic when it came to the way he would say things to people. And people would listen to him and cheer for him and say they'd follow him. So it says that he went for divination where Odomila told him to stop, you know, because he was trying to lead people down a path um, based on, you know, his own false virtue. And, um, you know, he was so intoxicated by the fame and notoriety that was coming from this public discourse he was providing. He chose to persist where he made a false claim to people that he knew of a promised land where there was no pain, no poverty. You know, the streets are paved in gold, you know, a utopia situation and um, he actually led them into the desert right um, some people say it was 40 days 40 years very similar to other biblical texts that we may have heard of but the issue is is this guy never led them to the promised land he basically led them in a circle for you know however much time until people became very disgruntled and checked him on it and when he realized they were going to kill him he escaped and left them there to die so that's in the Odu Ogunna Kwanaye. So that's probably where this one comes from. You know, it says, do not lead people down the wrong path. So for example, if someone's asking you, hey, this is what I want to accomplish in life, but rather than taking them down the quickest way from point A to point B, you take them on this goose chase that, you know, costs thousands of more dollars because it conveniences you, that is where the taboo lies here. Or, you know, if somebody wants to do something negative and you encourage them down that path, you know, say, hey, I want to do witchcraft to my boyfriend. You know, a competent and ethical Bawalao is not going to delve into this because that is taboo. What the right path would be is, hey, this is what your sign says. This is what you could do for your own betterment. 
you know, really coach that person so they don't delve into that behavior. And if they choose to, to not allow them to do it there. But that's what it means when it's saying taking people down false paths. And, you know, if you notice, each law builds upon each other. Don't say what you don't know. Don't do what you don't know how to do. Don't lead people down, you know, this rabbit hole. They all build upon each other because one leads to another leads to another. Man, wisdom after wisdom. Yeah. All right, next one. Number four, nunca engaña a la persona. So it's saying never trick people, right? And once again, it builds upon the previous one. So um, what could tricking somebody be? It could be, hey, I'm about Allah when I'm not. It could be, hey, I know how to do this when I don't. Um, it could be scamming people, which we're seeing a lot of now. Like I know a case where a woman paid $5,000 for a cacaria. And for the people that are watching, they know what that is. And somebody told them it was the Mano Rula. And obviously we know it is not. Um, you know, I had uh, one case where a woman paid thousands of dollars for a painting. And they, it was of La Caridad de Cobre, Our Lady of Charity. And they said, well, you have crowned Ochung now, you know, and, and it was just a painting, you know. So it, we're seeing a lot of that now. A lot of it is being dissipated now because, you know, with the Internet and with the information that's out there and there's people that are very vigilant, um, we're, we're avoiding a lot of that from happening now. But there was a point where people were really being taken advantage of, especially in places where Ifa was beginning or going through a renaissance period and people didn't know any better. So it's basically do not do anything to anyone that they are not actually desiring or aware enough to be able to decide whether they want it or not. Hmm. All right, here we go. Number five, no pretende ser sabio cuando no lo eres. Don't act like you're wise when you are not. Ooh. Um, it comes back to humility, right? I mean, when we talk about wisdom, Orumila was wise because he was humble. You know, when we talk about wisdom, wisdom is characterized by silence. So when it says don't act like you're wise when you're not, people who are actually wise don't act like they're wise. Because if you have to act like you're wise, you're more than likely not. Just like if you have to act like you're rich, you probably don't have that much money. If you have to act like you're tough, you probably have never practiced, you know, martial arts or what have you. Because usually the people who are in those positions of competency, they're, they're extremely humble. You know, if, if I'm a trained fighter, um, I'm probably avoiding fights, you know, because at that point my hands are weapons, right? Or if I actually am knowledgeable and wise in Ifa, I'm probably avoiding conflicts because I understand the power of the energies that I work with or any of these other things. You know, the richest person in the room is usually the most humbly dressed. You know, people are not wearing designer and things like that when they actually have, you know, wealth. So, you know, don't act like you're wise when you're not. You, you notice that, and this is happening, this is kind of an epidemic now, especially in the online scene of Ifa. You have a lot of people who leave comments on, whether it's our videos, other videos, um, debating or trying to, you know, prove something to be incorrect. Now, most of the time, these people are uninitiated. And usually when we check their credentials, they don't respond because they have no basis to be discussing Ifa, Orisha, Odu-centric themes with initiated priests. So that's one example of that. But then you actually have initiated people um, who actually haven't studied this philosophy or this school of thought, and they want to debate with people because they actually haven't learned anything. Um, so we see a lot of that as well, and you're, you're trying to engage in a, a pseudo-philosophical conversation with somebody trying to prove them wrong based on your own incompetency and, and lack of preparation. Um, so that's what Orumila was saying. When people would try to debate Orula or run up on Orula and be like this, that, and the third, he would, you know, respond very calmly. And he'd be like, are you a priest? Have you studied said Odu? Have you gone through said process? And time and time again, the, the aggressors did not. And we see that now even on an online spectrum where the majority of the agitators are either uninitiated or initiated but untrained. So that's what that one's referring to. Interesting. Okay, here we go. Number six, debe ser humilde y no egocéntrico. You should be humble and not egocentric. Um, if I is saying humility is the way to be able to avoid all of these ultimately. What is humility? Humility is not, you know, being a fan of yourself. Humility is not having to mention all of the wonderful things or negative things that are happening to you. Um, it's allowing your actions to speak for themselves. It's not debating with someone, even though you know they're wrong. 
Um, when we talk about humility, it's really a product of patience and good character, which are the central themes and ideas of our whole spirituality. Um, when we talk about egocentricity, it's something that has to be avoided because when the Babalawo or the Olorisha takes an oath to save humanity, we're literally entering into a life of servitude or public service. So you cannot be egocentric at that point. For example, you know, um, I've had situations where my God children have um, emergencies and I get called at an ungodly hour. Um, and, you know, sometimes it, it takes time away from my family. Or there's a phone call and they're going through a pressing situation. Or, you know, hey, my day off is now gone because I have this situation that I need to attend to. There can be no egocentricity within this priesthood or within this practice. Now, of course, everything is balances and limits. Please have a life, you know, because you deserve it. But um, Ifa says that ultimately to enter into this pact and into this lifestyle is to give yourself up for humanity. Do you think there's a fine line between humility and ego? Oh, yeah. Definitely. I mean, you have, we used to have this joke, me and my godfather, bless him wherever he is. He used to, he actually told me about a ceremony he went to one time. And the guy, you know, he seemed humble. You know, he wouldn't speak much. You know, it was, a, it was another guy directing um, some funeral rites. But, you know, he would always take kind of this moment to kind of put in, oh, but this, oh, but I know this, or this is how I do this, you know. And rather than just allowing his position of direction to kind of bear weight to the ceremony, I mean, you're already directing it. You already have that prestige. He would like, you know, throw in these little nuances that would make it seem, you know, that he was everything but humble. So you have those false people. You have those manipulative people who will, you know, do everything in their power to seem humble and wise. But, you know, that immaturity and that lack of preparation always comes through sooner or later because it comes from a lack of self-confidence. When you're confident about what you know and who you are, you will not be swayed, you know. So that, that's, that's a very fine line. And you constantly have to be checking yourself because it's easy to fall into one just like it is to fall into the other. Mm. Where are we at, number six, right? I think we just did number six. Okay. Number seven, no debe ser falso ni malintencionado. You should not be fake or come with negative intentions. If I, once again, it, it touches on authenticity, you know, being yourself, not trying to be something you're not. Um, you know, there's a lot of frustration, unfortunately, in our fraternity sometimes where people may have gone through negative situations that haven't allowed themselves to fulfill what they want to be in this. You know, the best advice I can give for all those brothers and sisters is, you know, keep looking. There are good people out there, whether it's us, whether it's some of the other channels we've interviewed. There are great people and elders and leaders of houses that exist. But, you know, it's it's very traumatizing where that first choice um, didn't fulfill what they were supposed to. And now we have to trust again where some people actually choose to stay in a negative situation rather than risking um, a more negative one in the future. But you have to take that risk, unfortunately, because life is ongoing. You know, some people go through horrible first experiences in relationships, um, and luckily some of them are able to get away, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't try again. Unfortunately, life is trial and error, but we learn from those mistakes. Without failure, we learn nothing. That's in the old do irete yero. Um, and coming with negative intentions, we should not be false with each other or Machiavellian in, in that regard. You know, if I'm interacting with a brother, um, I should only have good intentions for him. I should only have good intentions for us and what we have planned. If I notice that we're incompatible, it's better for me to distance myself rather than being, you know, Machiavellian and, you know, trying to see what I can get out of him when in reality I'm only thinking about myself. And unfortunately, there's a lot of those elements within this religion now where we actually aren't getting along as much. You know, it's really interesting because I look at some other fraternities and, you know, if Ifa was the original and all these Afro-Indigenous um, schools of thoughts were the original expressions of humanity philosophically these concepts of fraternity and, and humility and all these other things were begotten by us to them but i'm noticing at this point that there's other organizations that are actually serving as better examples of these concepts than we are sometimes so we have to really get back to our roots we have to get back to, you know, our fundamentals, our basis is so that we can be the best example of that being that we were the first ones to teach it. All right. So back to the list here. We got number eight. Number eight. No rompe las prohibiciones y tabúes. Do not break prohibitions and taboos. Um, in reality, we initiate into Ifa not to know what to do, but more importantly, to know what not to do. 
Um, we had a great episode with my brother, Damiano Bedois, about taboos and prohibitions and whatnot, where we listed a couple of the most important ones. Those are the ones we definitely want to avoid based on law number eight. Um, but our taboos, um, we have to respect them. Why? Because these are the things that we promised not to do in heaven when we got to earth to live the best life. When we're talking about a gift as incredible and, and, and monumental as life, it comes with sacrifice. Now, the ironic thing about the taboos is our taboos save our life at an indicated moment. So, for example, let's say your sign says don't eat red beans. But you persist in eating red beans and red beans and red beans. Now, you know, whatever negative effects come from that, you're going to suffer. And then apart from that, you know, when we actually need the red bean for spiritual purposes to be able to protect us, it no longer has that effectiveness, the same way a vaccine or a cure or any of these things won't if we overindulge in them, right? It's like if we eat cake and cake and cake and we're diabetic and then we just want to shoot, you know, a whole syringe of insulin into ourselves, you know, we're really just playing volleyball with our life. So it's the same thing, you know, we avoid these things to lead the best life possible. Big taboos, apart from the things from your sign, um, are the ones that to come. Because if you notice, this second half now is really, you know, talking about, you know, the actions that we take um, or should not take to lead the best life based, based on what Ifa says. Hmm. All right. Yeah, here we go. Next one. Number nine. El abor debe mantener su instrumento sagrado limpio. The abor, the priest, should maintain his instruments or his sacred instruments and tools clean. So in the Odu Abotura D, um, there's a proverb that says, Ifa does not mix with pestilence or that which stinks, Right. Um, and what it means is, in that sign of the Odu Otura Ladi, was where the Babalawo was working a lot of Ifa. He was a very high-paced guy. And sometimes he would feed his Ifa icon and not have the time to be able to clean it. And it would go days like this sometimes. And he started noticing that things started going negatively for him, where he wanted to perform a divination to see if he was working so much Ifa and doing so many great things, why wasn't he feeling well? So, when the divination was performed, the Odu Obotura Di was revealed where Ifa said that he needed to cleanse his icon on a more consistent basis to be able to not fall, you know, backwards or in atraso, right? And when he did that, he felt great. He started seeing the fruits of his labor. He cleaned his Ifa icon, his Ifa tools, his area, his temple. And, um, you know, based on that, he was able to get great results. So, when we're talking about the tools, whether it's the Bawalawo with his Irofa, whether it's the Olorisha priest with his beads or his shells, whatever it may be, cleanliness is close to godliness. I actually got that from the movie ATL, Phil. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's very, very important, you know, because, for example, one of the great compliments we get at the Botanica is that it's more like a boutique than a Botanica. We keep it very clean. The air is nice. You know, the energy, forgive me. Um... All of these things are really on point where sometimes you walk into certain, you know, ATR establishments where you see the chicken beheaded in the corner, or the blood on the floor, or a powder everywhere. You know, people leave worse than when they came and some of them just walk right out. So Ifa says here, cleanliness is close to godliness. All of our icons, all of our things, unless otherwise stipulated by a sign for a specific reason, need to be maintained clean and hygienic the same way we're talking about that as well as our bodies interesting yeah um being clean is like really really important in my house because my wife says the same thing oh yeah lucia's not playing man it's important you know because what what happens is if we allow things to become cluttered and whatnot you know this is where negative spiritualities love to hide that's in the odu odiroso where legua would hide under the pile of clothes in the corner or the garbage you know next to our tv you know, when you got teenagers, you know this all too well. You know what I'm saying? God bless them. <laughs> all right, here we go. Next one. Number 10. El abo debe mantener su templo limpio. The abo or the practitioner of Ifa must maintain their temple clean. Now, it kind of re reiterates the last one, but it, it expounds itself upon where our temple, right, our home, you know, our botanica, our studio, wherever it is that we manifest or express ourselves needs to needs to be clean. Now we're not only talking hygienically, we're talking socially, where only legal things are happening there. 
It's also referring to our bodies being our temple. You know, we need to put good things into ourselves to get a great output, right? Um, and that's what if I was saying here, anything that goes against this concept is completely taboo. So putting the right things in our body, making sure healthy, moral and natural things are going on in our home businesses. This is what led to uh, great results and a great lifestyle for the Ifa practitioner. Wow. All righty. Here we go. Number 11. El abo debe respetar a los débiles, tratarlos bien y con mucho respeto. The priest or the Ifa practitioner should respect the weak and treat them well. Um, the Babalawo has always been seen as a man's man. You know, in the history of the fraternity, he was seen as a made man. He was seen as somebody that was kind, someone that was affable, someone that was patient, someone that was understanding. The Babalawos were even called in at the moment of, you know, litigation and whatnot to consult Ifa to see who had divine right in a dispute or misunderstanding to be able to calm the situation. So when we're talking about somebody who upholds that figurehood within a culture or a community, it only makes sense that we would not, you know, take advantage or abuse of those that can't defend themselves, whether it's people with special needs, the handicapped, um, the homeless, the displaced, anyone that is going through a difficult situation is meant to be supported by the Wawalawu. Not necessarily economically or monetarily, that, that could happen as well though, but just treatment. The Wawalawu has to know how to interact with everyone on a respectful and equal level, you know, whether it's Olorisha, practitioner. This is very, very, very important because there's really nothing more deplorable than somebody who is arrogant enough to, um, you know, take advantage of their position or how well things are going for them to kind of look down upon or mistreat those who are incapable of doing it for themselves. The greatest satisfaction is helping someone um, or assisting someone to be able to do what it is they need to have the same quality of life we all deserve. Would um, a Baba Lao be considered as like a protector as well? Absolutely. You know, we're the protector of secrets. We're the protector of nature. You know what I'm saying? Um, the Baba Lao will, when they say when we die, not only the Baba Lao, but the practitioner of Ifa, they say when we die, we're going to be judged by three groups or three kingdoms, right? The first kingdom is the plant kingdom. How did you treat plants? How did you treat nature? You know, did you litter? Did you not litter? Did you, did you kill the random plant because you were bored and you needed that sense of self-gratification. You're going to be judged by them. Then you're going to be judged by the animal kingdom. You know, did you mistreat a dog? You know, the five even says even a dog deserves respect. Did you mistreat a dog? Did you mistreat an animal? You know, did you, did you not consume everything within an animal that you sacrificed? Did you sacrifice unnecessarily? How did you treat the animal when you sacrificed him? You're going to be judged by them and ultimately mankind. You know, how did you treat your fellow man? You know, how did you treat the person um, that was handicapped or the person that, you know, needed assistance? You know, did you deny them politely? Did you tell them off? You know, did, how were you with humanity? Because the way you are is the way you will be treated. And, you know, this law really reiterates that to perfection. Okay. All right. Here we go. Number 12. El abo debe respetar y tratar bien a los ancianos. The abo must respect and treat well the elders. Um, Ifa is a culture and Yoruba is a culture completely based on respect, not only to our ancestors, those who are not here, but to our elders, those that are here. Ifa says the only way to heaven, the only way to the great beyond is through two people. Um, our children, if we choose to procreate and are able to procreate, but more, even more importantly, sometimes our parents, right? Those who are above us, whether it's our spiritual parents, birth parents, Ifa says there can be no blessing without the blessing from these people. The Odu Osache says the greatest blessing we'll ever receive is from our mother, right? Um, Hijo bendecido tiene la bendición de Olodumare. So that means Ifa says he who is blessed by his parents will always be blessed by God because to be able to get to God, we have to go through our parents. We have to go through our children. So the respecting of elders, whether it's throwing ourselves on the floor whether it's reserving an extra word that's unnecessary, whether it's questioning something we're not completely versed upon, it's very important to, you know, pay homage and give space to these people who allowed us to be here spiritually or, you know, within the world. This is also in the Yodu of Baba Gundameji, where the respect to the elders really started because there's a story where there was two friends, right? And they went for divination where this Odu was revealed where they were both recommended to 
have children, if they were able to and completely dedicate themselves to their families. Um, one chose to, and the other one chose not to, ridiculing the one who was choosing to because he said, you know, you're wasting time. Look at all the women we could be with. Look at all the parties we could be in. And you want to be with one woman and have kids. You know, you're crazy. So they split ways. You know, 60 years goes by. And one day, the friend who chose not to create a family was on a corner. You know, he was going through, he was displaced, he was homeless, he was poor. And there was a great procession that was going through the village of a man that was going to be recognized by his children. And, you know, the guy on the corner was like, you know, they're interrupting me. This is my corner. You know, this guy, you know, who cares? Who gives, who gives a damn about him? And when he looked, he saw his friend. And he ran up to his friend and he said, oh, my God, my friend, how are you? Where the friend stopped the procession and took a moment to speak to him. He said, how are you, my brother? He said, well, life has gone really horribly for me. You know, I, I, I don't have a family. I'm alone. I'm probably going to die alone. You know, it's, uh, I have a lot of regret. And he said, how have things gone for you? Did you see the guy they're doing the procession for? He said, well, to be honest with you, they're doing the procession for me. My children um, have chosen to celebrate me on my 80th birthday um, because they feel that I treated their mother well. I raised them well. I provided them with everything they needed. And uh, I give all praise to Ifa because he gave me a place to be and to be loved. And at that moment, you see the, uh, the manifestation of what Ifa said. The greatest investment, um, you know, we can make is within our children or within the people who came before us to have that prestige to be recognized by both. Okay. Yeah. All right, here we go. Next one. Number 13, el abuelo debe respetar a las leyes morales. The abuelo must respect the moral laws. Ifa is completely based on nature. Um, in my opinion, just like Ifa's opinion, nature is perfect. What's right is right. What's wrong is wrong. Of course, there's gray areas to a certain degree. But if it goes against the laws of nature, it's ultimately, you know, we look at modern law, it's based on nature, right? Why should, you know, children never be abused? Why should we not murder indiscriminately? Why should we not steal? Why should, you know, all of these different things, this is based on natural law. And it really comes down to how would one feel seeing horrible things like that occurring? Um... So the Babalawo is seen as the judge of nature. I mean, when we sit down at the Oponfa, and whether we have an Iroke or an Irofa, whatever it is we use to tap the side of the, the tray, it's reminiscent of the gavel and mallet and, you know, what the judge uses um, to be able to, you know, dictate, you know, his, his uh, response or, you know, his determination. So ultimately, the Bawalawo or Ifa being manipulated by the Bawalawo is meant to identify that which is moral and that which is not. But if something is not moral or goes against nature or is seen as heinous and inhumane, Ifa does not, does not support it whatsoever. As a Bawalawo in 2023, do you find that the line of what's moral and what's not um, thinner and thinner? I don't even know if there's a line anymore, brother. I mean, when you kind of look at society now, people always doing that which conveniences them. People always doing, you know, or making an excuse for whatever behavior they see as proper, improper. Um, that's why we need Ifa more now than ever because we have no moral compass, I think, or social compass anymore. People are willing to do whatever it is to get something that they've been told is what they need. So, for example, if I'm looking at this Gucci, this pair of Gucci socks, right, this false impression that has been, you know, placed upon me through propaganda or frustration, social trauma, is telling me I need that to impress somebody, whether it's myself or those who could really care less whether I have it or not. So what am I willing to do to be able to get that item? And the sad thing is, is, you know, people are doing whatever they can to get whatever they want, not realizing that it's really, it's, it's, it's deteriorating the moral fiber that is to help us get through life because that's the only way we find strength. You know, we're placed, you know, we're constantly facing decisions and issue every day, right, wrong. What should I do? What should I not do? Sometimes less is more, but you see people trying to do the most now trying to get things that really don't matter. We're, we're not seeking enlightenment, enlightenment. We're not seeking God. We're being placed within a system where we don't even have time to look into our higher selves. That's why we need this more than ever, because if we have no higher power, the, the scariest human being, in my opinion, or the scariest thing that could exist is that which does not believe in a higher power. 
Now, mind you, that doesn't need to be God, but you know, your higher power could be your your children. Your higher power could be, I don't know, whatever it is, but man has to be accountable to somebody because we're not God. We live amongst laws and codes and all of the things that, you know, the commandments are talking about. So, you know, it's 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 a thin line if there is a line anymore. Good one there. All right, here we go. Number 14, el abo nunca traiciona a un, a un amigo y no duerme con su mujer. The abo never betrays a friend or sleeps with his wife. Um, now, mind you, these are very old scriptures. Like, you know, the, the ultimate betrayal was seen as infidelity, you know, especially from one brother to another. But, you know, when we're talking about betrayal. It's, it's seen as completely taboo. And it kind of leans back on number seven where, you know, we shouldn't have false intentions or be be fake with people. Um, do not betray. What is betrayal? The, the most important thing, you know, is trust. We should never betray the trust of those who deposit it within us, whether we're getting along or not. You know, for example, you know, I've interacted with people um, on a client basis, on a social basis where I might know more things than I'd like to. And we might not interact anymore, but that doesn't mean I need to divulge anything that was, you know, placed within me in confidence. And um, that's one example of many, you know, whether it's, you know, respecting someone's loved one, respecting someone's children, their home, their best interests, we should not betray. And, you know, there's so many levels to that. But really, what is betrayal? Betrayal is when you are doing something for your convenience without the knowledge of the other person to be able to determine whether they want that to happen or not. Yeah. Very, very wise there. Yeah. It seems like it's harder to have loyal people now because people are always in it for themselves. It's, people don't want to go through pain, Phil. I, I think that's what really leads to betrayal is for example, um, let's say, I don't know, let's say, let, let's talk about theft, right? Let's say my friend has a Rolex watch that I love. Right. I, you know, I, I just I want it. It's the dream. It's the Roly presidential with the with the diamonds. So rather than going through the pain of accepting I don't have it or I don't have the means to get it right now, or rather than becoming envious and jealous, rather than that, get motivated to find ways to collaborate to get there somehow or even establish my own situation to get what I want. I'd rather just take. So you begin to see the core thing there is pain. They don't want to go through the pain of recognizing inadequacy at the moment of achieving what they want at that moment what can i do better to be able to get what i want rather than taking it from somebody so the betrayal rooted in pain will lead me to take something from my brother um even though he's worked and done everything i haven't to be able to get it now what could that materialize in i can steal it when he's not looking god forbid you know take actions to take it from him right in front of him you, you just don't know but i mean you look at any like you look even you know in, in the communities like even you know music and things like that artists being killed over materials you know just a bunch of nonsense you know over something that depreciates it really means nothing yeah that's true all right here we go all righty then number 15 el abo no debe revelar secretos o ser chimoso the abo must never reveal secrets or be a gossiper this is this is so important um, the word Baba Lawo means father who, father of the secrets of, or father of that which will not be seen. Um, our whole basis is silence. It's kind of like Omedta, right? It's, it's the code of silence. It's the oath, the oath of silence. Um, and I think it's the one that's being most betrayed right now. I think when you look online, um, we're one of the few options that has never betrayed the dogma of Ifa by speaking about what goes on behind the curtain. Um, cause I remember when I took that oath, you know, in a room with 16 leopards, like I like to say, you know, I swore to never reveal anything behind that curtain and I haven't. And, um, I think that really separates us because whether what people are saying or is right or wrong or legitimate or not, they're presenting it in a way where it could seem that way to somebody who is uninitiated, causing them to delve deeper into information that is not compatible with them. Um, so we don't reveal secrets, whether it's our, you know, our practice, our ceremony, or whatever it is, our clients deposit in confidence in us within the privacy of a consultation room, um, say less, the wisest guy, the smartest guy in the room practically says nothing. And whatever his motivations are, are his own. But when you know what you know, 
and you're confident and you're capable, you, you don't really talk that much. I'll be frank with you. As I've gotten older, I speak much less. I think the most words people get out of me is on this channel because, you know, when I'm out and about, I mean, you really don't hear Joseph's voice. Um, so it's, it's very important to maintain that because that's the basis of our whole practice, you know, say less. Um, as far as the gossiping, we're falling into that taboo horribly. That's why our community is suffering the way it is. You know, whether it's situations of Baalaos trying to question other Baalaos publicly rather than pulling people to the side and having an adult conversation, you know, we're being plagued by that within this fraternity, um, you know, or, or just, you know, this person said that, or having an unhealthy culture um, within, you know, their spiritual house due to lack of preparation, preparation and study, who are usually the perpetrators and culprits of the culprits of this behavior. This is probably the most transgressed law. You know, we're, we're talking too much and we're talking about that which doesn't matter or could divide us. And, and that's why we haven't been formally recognized as a, a world power religion. Mm. Do, you, do you find that in, in today's world of technology and, you know, there's a, you're not the only person to do this kind of on YouTube. And Correct. Do you find that other Babalawos are kind of peeling back the curtain on things that they shouldn't be? Yeah, no, and not just Bawa Laos. Um, there's, a, there's a couple personalities out there that, you know, I would never, you know, uh, gratify with a mention. But you see a lot of people just talking a lot of what they shouldn't be, a lot of nonsense. And then I think another thing is, is, you know, everybody has a lot of uh, confidence to say whatever they like behind a camera screen or a computer screen. Um, the thing about me is that, you know, being somebody that, that's legitimate within this fraternity director, somebody that, you know, is, is really looked upon to serve. Um, I'm always very careful about what I say and who I say it to, because I more than likely will be face to face with that person one day. Um, you know, even though it's not necessarily listed, but it could be interpreted from these laws. I, I always say, never say in private what you wouldn't say to that person publicly, you know, and, um, you avoid a lot of situations like that. And as an adult, as a man, that, that's how I was taught, you know, you, you speak a certain type of way to be spoken to a certain type of way. And, you know, some of the atrocities we see spoken over social media, especially between us as Babalawo, Olorisha, you know, and, and really, you know, the verse person isn't going to be uber offended by it because unfortunately it's become the norm. But what scares me is the amount of people who are uninitiated that that's the first thing they're seeing, um, a, a priest say within our culture and then being like, I don't want to be a part of that. Like, look how they speak to each other. It's terrifying. Not knowing that there's more beautiful things within it profoundly, but they'll never be given a chance because of the way we're representing ourselves on camera. That's true. So are we at the last one now? Number 16, man. And the reason there was 16 laws is because there were 16 medjis. You know, the original 16 signs, each of them was delving into one of these, uh, these, I won't say the word sins, but transgressions, you know, sin is, you know, it's a connotation of evil and we really don't have those concepts. We're all about the balance of nature, action, reaction, repercussion, but each one of them had to own up to, to one of their issues to be able to build from it. So yeah, number 16. All right, here we go. El abo debe respetar los demás abo y nunca dormir con la apete de otro. El respeto mutuo. The abo must never should always respect the other awol, never sleep with his wife, and they should have a mutual respect. So once again, the very old world, hey, you know, respect another person's partner, you know. Um, you know, infidelity, you know, if you notice, it's been mentioned a couple times here. Um, it's not a joke. You know, everybody likes to say, Orula had a bunch of women. Well, he was married to all of them, and they all gave him permission. So if that's not your situation, you know, stay home. Focus on home. Because um, infidelity within nature is punishable by death. It's not a joke. Um, and there's various signs that speak of it, you know. And then even more heinously, you know, sleeping with the wife of, of a brother. You know what I'm saying? Or somebody you care about or, or disrespecting. And it doesn't have to be as epic as an unfaithful um, entanglement affair situation. Just just the disrespect or, or not respecting those boundaries. Avoiding being in situations that are, that are dubious. You know, just completely respect another person's home, right? Um, but, you know, when you look at the real root of the mutual respect or the respect between our walls or Olorisha, that's probably, besides 15, the one that we're really messing up on the most. We're not respecting each other. What is respect? Respect is a conversation. Respect is an opportunity. Respect is logic. 
you know, rather than attacking somebody on a public forum or rather than trying to discredit somebody uh, based on something, you know, not factual or completely irrelevant, you know, I think we've lost the ability to be able to speak to each other as human beings and adults. And, um, you know, immaturity is not going to be a vehicle that we can use to grow into the future. So respect is huge. So, for example, if I have a, a situation that I need to speak about with a brother, wow, 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 I speak directly to him in private, you know, as long as things have not gotten out of control. Or, you know, there, there was always that, you know, and, and we never, ever discredit each other in front of people who are not initiated or are not family or, you know, I, I actually had a situation um, one time where, you know, I had a, uh, a godchild who, you know, made a little bit of a mistake per se within a ceremony. And, um, you know, I didn't say anything, you know, at that moment. It was brought to my attention by some of the other people there as well. And, um, you know, I made it very clear to them that, you know, I'll speak to him um, when I see fit and, you know, I'll address it um, in the fashion I see fit. And I ultimately had that conversation with him very calmly. And, um, you know, his first reaction was apologetic. But, you know, he actually told me, he said, I wish you would have reprimanded me in front of the whole ceremony in front of everybody, you know, to show how sorry I am. And I said, I, I don't need to chastise you in front of people that aren't family. Um to be able to, you know, get a reaction or for us to be able to grow from this. Because at the end of the day, we're a family. I can never make you look weak um, or, you know, unjustified in front of a group. I would never do that to you because that breeds hatred. Um, he really appreciated it. And I, I told him this is how you need to handle situations as well, you know, as a family, in private, and with class. We're not here to publicly, you know, skewer people cybernetically. Um, and you notice the really humble the really prepared, the really wise, we don't behave like this. We're not on Reddit, you know, saying a bunch of random comments. We're not on Facebook. We're not on any of these other, you know, mediums just talking a bunch of nonsense or trying to discredit people who have prepared themselves. You know, we're about the business. We're about getting to work and we're about to, we're about, you know, providing a great product and service to clients that are going to speak well about us, join Ifan or Isha and help us spread this across the world like it should be avoiding those kind of behaviors. Yeah. Okay. So wrapping up here, right? Yeah. Great video, man. Yeah. No, that was impressive. So remind us again, when did you actually write these down? So check it, right? I'll never forget. Um, to be able to do Ifa, I actually had to sell my car. What? Yeah. So Wait, what kind of car did you have? I had a, at the time, if I did, when did I do Ifa, Joseph? Um, I did Ifa, I'm about to be eight this year. We're in 2023. So was it 2015? So it was in 2015, 2014-ish, I think, and I had a 2013 Toyota Corolla S. Oh, you had a nice one. All right, man, I was doing, put it this way, in my year in white, I was doing Uber. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like, you'd see on the reviews in Uber, they were like, Mr. White was great, because I would wear, like, all white, like, from head to toe. <laughs> and um, when my godfather threw the number at me to do Ifa, I took that car and I sold it. You know what I'm saying? And I still had to work the next six months to fill up the rest of the money. Um, but what I did was, is the day I sold the car and I took him the lump sum for things to become serious was the day he told me, regardless of the funds you've given me, you need to learn these by memory by this date. And, um, then you'll be really eligible. If not, you lose your money. And it was, it was a handsome sum of money. So I remember when I came home from Miami that day, I, uh, I wrote it on that last piece of cardboard. I don't think I even had a paper big enough to fit all of these. And I sat down and I wrote them out after he gave them to me. And the reason I chose these were because you're going to see a bunch of different versions of these laws. This, these were the most like complete, you know, codified that made the most sense to me as far as like um, a basis. So I wrote it on a piece of cardboard. I think I found it in my grandmother's garage and I hung it on my wall. And um, I enjoyed every moment of learning them. I enjoyed every moment of incorporating them, you know, writing them out, looking at them every day and and realizing how this was going to make me a better man um, to fulfill this priesthood. Because before you can be a good priest, you have to be a good man. You have to be a good adult. You have to be a good woman. You have to be a good human being. And um, what I loved about these was, is regardless of spiritual persuasion, you could use these to become a better human being. And I think that's what Ifa has done for me and the majority of people who have joined. Wow. Is, is there one that you know, supersedes the, the others, or are they kind of all on the equal plane there? I think I love number 16, man, because uh, just the concept of mutual respect more than anything. 
Um, 15 is very important to me as well because the, you know, the not revealing secrets, um, that's very important to me because, you know, everybody's real gung ho to do Ifa or take an oath when everything's lovely. But, um, when you're put between your morals and pressure, you know, who are you? And that, that really defines whether a busted pipe or a diamond is what you are because pressure will reveal either one. So, you know, those two are probably amongst all of them. But, you know, the secrecy is very important to me. But I think even more important, number 16, is the mutual respect. Because that's that, that, in, in my household, being a Cuban-American household, um, that was really the first concept that was taught to me as a young man. I'll never forget my Uncle Martin. May he rest in peace. Um, he, was, he was the first man to ever instill that concept in me. He said... What's more important, love, fear, respect? And I said, I have no idea. You know, I'm like five years old. I'm like, dude, I'm trying to watch cartoons. <laughs> you like chicken nuggets? You know, he's like, you're, you're, you're a whole man in front of me asking me some really epic stuff. And he said, respect, nephew. And I said, why? He said, because it's a mixture of both. Yeah. Love and fear equalizes into respect because if people respect you, um, you know, the, the love and the fear they have will mesh in a way where, you know, they won't hate you, but they won't not take you seriously neither. And if you want to survive in this world, especially as a young man, without your respect, you won't even be able to make it from here to the corner. I mean, you know, the part of Miami that we're from was, was starting to get a little hectic. So, you know, these were concepts that he held dear. Um, so respect. And when I saw that was the most important thing in Ifa, you know, the, the 16th law, the heaviest law. Um, you know, I, I realized quickly, you know, this is why I'm here. And um, it's the one we need the most, you know, respect, respect is it's free. It's it's necessary. And you know, even a dog deserves it. So the fact that there's moments when we're not giving it to each other, very sad thing, but it also gives us the opportunity, the opportunity to better ourselves and grow and through respect, we will become great. Wow. Great episode, man, that a lot of great information from that. That's you memorize that. I didn't even have to show that that paper up there, but yeah, it's that's ingrained. for all the viewers. It's ingrained. It's so ingrained. And guys, just a couple notes, man. This episode is brought to you by Botanica Candles and more. Um, you know, you can schedule consultations, order products through the website, um, classes, or do interpretations, etc. It's also brought to you by, um, you know, the Sapphire team, elite team, real estate team headed by Poroye and my son, Danny. Um, you know, definitely if you have any real estate needs whatsoever, or questions about this very, very, um, you know, active market, mm -hmm. please go ahead and take advantage of it. Um, the podcast is on all major platforms. Um, you know, I can only imagine what the, uh, the listener amount is at this point, you know, be sure to check it out as well. If you're out there driving or, you know, are able to, you know, take advantage of that as well. Like, comment, share, subscribe. Any final notes, Phil? Yeah. So we got some shout outs. And oh, God, and yes. And today, I don't have the elevator music. You're breaking but my heart. I have, I have a harp. I mean, that's cool, right? I love it. I love right, it. Classic. So here we go. We're going with some shout outs here. All right. VIP shout outs to Mayona Potter. Mayona, thank you. We got Kid Glide. Kid Glide. Hey. We got Senia. Senia, thank you. We got Mark H. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Mark. And here are the super fans. We got Trinity Young. Trinity, thank you. This is a two-month person here. We got Ruben Loya. Ruben, welcome. Thank you. Six months here with Eddie Brown. Oh, Eddie, man. Thank you. And Asata Honeychild. Oh, thank you guys so much for your consistent support. If you know somebody that can benefit from the channel membership, please get in there. We're going through some great herbs and paths, and uh, I think they'll be able to get some value from it, guys. Let them know. All right, guys. We'll catch you later. See the light.